Yo, what's hey, up? What's up, man? <laughs> How are all the Tomies doing out in the multiverse right now? That's my question. Hopefully quite well. Yeah, dude. Um, how you doing, Walter? I'm doing good, man. I've been outside most of the day. I was filling a hole with dirt. I, bought, yeah. like, I went to Menards and I bought like 12, uh, like 40 pound bags of dirt. Yeah. Well, you've been real into gardening recently, right? Well, I'm getting into like plants. I'm still not gardening. So this was like a a boarded project where we were digging a hole in the ground for uh, a swing set. And then we just ended up putting the swing set like somewhere else. So (laughs) then we just had this like 10 by 12 nightmare pit in our yard. Yeah. And I was like responsible for it. So then I had to go make that menards trip those bags <laughs> fill in some dirt yeah dude Dude, my dog's been digging up our backyard man every time i mow the grass i about break my ankle it's yeah. like driving me nuts man <laughs> um well dude like let's right get to it um i'm pretty excited for this show um we're having um we're talking about something that i never dreamed that i would talk about partly because i didn't know what it was <laughs> right. Right. Up until, you know, um, honestly, it was with Tiffany, right? Because mm-hmm. um, she was the first one to talk about, like, the Order of the Golden Dawn and stuff and hermeticism. Um, and uh, so I hit Reddit, which is what I do, because right. we are the Tome of Chaos, not the Tome of Playing It Safe. We just grab people off of Reddit, you know, yeah. and uh, um, and try and bring them into the fold and uh, saint them in chaos and all this stuff. So I'm I'm pretty pumped right now. Yeah, it's exciting, man. Yeah, dude. So um, I want to introduce to everyone right now um, a fellow that I just met uh, who hopefully he'll become a good friend of ours at the Tome, um, especially because as soon as his video came on, you know, Google Hangouts, he's wearing like the cloth and everything. Oh, dude. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Like, I didn't know we were getting a baller. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, I just want to introduce to everyone right now, a Mr. Anthony Benjamin. What's up, dude? Hi, everybody. What's going on? Yeah, man. How you doing, Anthony? I'm doing all right. Yeah. Um, Definitely better than you with the monster pit. And I don't know if I would <laughs> call myself a baller, but oh, I mean, dude. we're, we're going to do our best. Yeah, man. I mean, <laughs> how can you not be? I did, how do uh, Can I ask you a question? I've always wanted to ask this. I don't want it to offend anyone, but how does that shirt work? <laughs> I've always seen them, and they're super tight, you know? Like, yeah. I just don't understand. Like, is there like a, is it like kind of like a tie? It- so there are two versions, and this is the cheap version. Okay. Uh, I also have an, an expensive version, but that's for special occasions. Okay. One, the expensive version, the uh, collar is detached. Oh. The cheap version, the collar is an insert. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah for so- everybody who uh, can't see it, it's like the uh, traditional Catholic, like uh, priest, right? Like Catholics mostly yeah. wear them, right? Yeah. Catholic priest like uh, shirt with the white square on the collar. Um, all right, well, we're done with that question. I just had to ask, um, Anthony. Can you tell everybody all the Tomies like what you're about, man? Sure. Uh, I am a philosophic theologian. I'm a Christian hermeticist. Um, I'm actually a master in the Order of the White Road. Or, yeah, and uh, you know. So my primary job is to teach, instruct, write uh, on hermeticism, on Christian theology, on mystical Christian theology, and how those two intersect. Okay. So that's kind of what I do. Hell yeah. Um, so I don't know. You have questions, Walter? Well, I mean, so as someone who's completely, uh, you know, uh, unknowledged in the subject, what is hermeticism and what is uh, Christian hermeticism? All right, so let's start with hermeticism. That's something that most people are familiar with um, who run in occult circles. So essentially hermeticism is the philosophy and theology, so essentially the faith system supposedly developed by um, Hermes Trismegistus or Hermes the Thrice Great. Yeah. The issue. Yeah. Yeah. I, re- I was um, reading about him. It, it, now, the other 
Hermes they talk about? Is that Noah and Enoch? So there are uh, lots and lots like the uh, theories abound of who the Hermes was yeah. and whether or not there are multiple Hermes. Okay. Um, much of the confusion is laid in the later, what's called the later pagan period, which is between the second century BC and the uh, second century AD. Okay. And what's basically happening here is there is a hodgepodge of mystical thought coming up out of Egypt and out of the East, mixing with the new uh, Christian movements, birthing lots of different denominations of Christianity and birthing new denominations of paganism as well. So what happens out of this is that every different denomination develops its own kind of mythos about who Hermes was and how they fit into their version of events. Yeah. Uh, so who's who Hermes, the Hermes was, as far as a person we could nail down, has been lost to all of history. What is left to us is his teachings. Okay, so just his writings. Right. Well, his writings and the writings of his disciples. Okay. Yeah, so tell us about Hermes. So, um, as I say, getting to the heart of Hermes means getting to the heart of the myriad of theories of about who he was. Personally, I believe that uh, he was Imhotep, which was a servant of a pharaoh who was also an architect in ancient Egypt. I actually have a blog up about it. Yeah. sent you guys the link. Uh, long story short... Um, Hermes is believed by many to be the person who originally brought us, uh, who either brought us originally or developed into a kind of perfection. The original philosophies, magics, and the original thoughts about science and alchemy. And, uh, you know, again, amongst people who are hermetists, that varies about whether or not he kickstarted those sciences and studies or whether he developed them to the fullest. One thing is for sure that uh, if you go back to the ancient world, you find crystallized in the identity of Hermes uh, a great deal of artistry and science. So the ancients seem to have definitely thought that he had a big hand in getting things started. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So he was about alchemy and shit. Well, amongst many other things, <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, so, and then you you call yourself a Christian hermeticist. Yep. So where what's that? So this is, uh, it, it, it means that you have to study the deep intricacies of hermetism in its various kinds. Okay. Essentially, what you start to understand is that Hermes, uh, was a monotheist. And that seems to be clear from the earliest days. And that simply doesn't fit in to almost anything in the ancient Near East. We're talking Egypt, uh, generally Mesopotamia, um, all the way, basically, if you take the Mediterranean as a Roman lake in the late pagan period, the entire Eastern half um, from Turkey down to the Holy Land, down into Egypt, uh, there's nothing in the ancient world, with the exception of the movement of Akhenaten and the sun disk, to even remotely uh, take us to a monotheistic ideal, except for Judaism. Mm. So when you start to study hermetism in the context of, of monotheism versus pagan, uh, you know, pagan thought and pantheism, what you end up with is holy, holy smack, man. This is the first, especially if you can date it back to the 27th, 27th century BC. This is the first blossomings of monotheism in the Near East. And of course, that gave rise to the entire Western view because the culture in Egypt gave rise, of course, we're all familiar with Exodus, at least. If, even if all we did was watch the Disney movie. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for sure. we can clearly see the continuity between Egypt and the Jewish uh, religious ideals. 
Yeah. We can all see the continuity between, if you study history and you study religious history in particular, the continuity between Christianity or not Christianity, Egypt and uh, Greek ideals. Yeah. And we can definitely see the continuity between Greek ideals and uh, European ideals, which eventually became, uh, qu- you know, quote unquote, Christian ideals. Okay. So this ideal of Hermes being the first flowering of monotheism, claiming, of course, as he did, that he got his messages from God. Then you start to see him giving statements that there will be, they will come after him, one that is greater than him. Then you start to see Jesus claiming not simply to be one prophet amongst many, but to be the Logos himself, the very incarnation of the divine on earth. And it's interesting. A lot of people like to draw uh, parallels between Jesus and a lot of other gods and deities. They like to try to mythize, you know, draw him into a greater mythos that other cultures have told about themselves. This simply isn't true when you consider the monotheistic nature of Jewish thought. Bottom line, Jesus was claiming to be something other entirely. How could an eternal God who created the universe, who pre-existed forever and always, um, be born of a virgin in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere? Mm. This was something, not a story that most cultures told about their gods. Their gods are exalted beings. Anyway, this individual Jesus claims to be somebody who is, has a very special relationship with mankind and a very special relationship with God. Long story short, he also claims to have a very mystical experience of divinity. Those around him claim to have a very mystical experience of divinity. And this seems to be a fulfillment of a lot of the ideals uh, that Hermes foretold. And even if you don't buy into the idea of the prophecy element, the very same concepts that Hermes talked about, which had never yet been espoused, like God being infinite, all-knowing, everywhere, and yet simultaneously present wherever it is that he is, Um, that the universe being present in the mind of him, that God being described by Hermes to be the all, and then... Jesus simultaneously saying the father is everywhere. Consider the lilies, um, you know, where two or more of you gather there too. I am these things, um, you know, and it gets even deeper whenever you study the, the deep theology of it, you know, the intricacies that can't be explained here at length. So when you start to understand this, you start to see that there is definitely a theological continuity between Hermes the late pagan period and a lot of what Hermes um, disciples talked about Jesus and the, in the Christ movement, the early church and all the way up. Um, So therefore it is perfectly possible to be a Christian uh, hermitist Mm. and basically say, Hey, you know, there's a more mystical version of Christianity, which was probably espoused in the first century. Um, the church to try to keep pace with the world has lost much of its mystical tradition as the world has been kind of um, sterilized into a petri dish of science christianity tried to remain relevant by following along if you go back to the first century it's not so simple Mm. so so you believe that hermes so hermes was first Right? Yep. He wrote about mm-hmm. monotheism before anybody else. Right. Right? Um, right. And he wrote uh, that somebody was coming after him. That after him, you believe, was Jesus. Right. Right. So do you believe the Christian views that Jesus died on the cross for our sins? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. right. Sweet. So you, basically... Uh, hermeticism and Christianity just kind of, in your view, just kind of fall into each other right Right. okay awesome awesome i think that gives people background yeah that's a interesting because i mean in the the church that me and dave were a part of uh Mm -hmm. for a while there was definitely a like 
you know, uh, anti-Gnostic kind of anti, uh, anything outside of the immediate, you know, whatever the, the, the new Testament, the old Testament, what you're told, it was like, don't even look at it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, for so sure. I, did yeah. you, did you come from a like traditional Christian background first and then find this as like a supplement? Yeah. I think that we, I want to get into that. I think that, I think that what we should do is this is the part where it's like, you know, what we do on this show and you've said you'd listened is like, right. it's the gospel of you, right? Like we're right. trying to build a new religion and we need gospels. Um, <laughs> so, uh, like what is the I'm gospel? <laughs> <laughs> what is, what is the gospel of Anthony? Right. Is what we want to know. Like where, you know, like Walter said, what, like, what was your background growing up? Like, I, you know, we do about an hour and a half, so we can't run like crazy. Right, right. You can't hear every story, but we would like to start with the beginning, you know? Right, man. So, so, um, I shall begin like David Copperfield, right? I am born, I grew up. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, when I grew up, uh, I grew up in a small town in the Midwest. Oh, what small town? Uh, actually, Farmington, Missouri. Oh, okay. If Farmington. You right. If, yeah, <laughs> I can take a guess all. at what they did there. <laughs> right, right, right. So long story short, I, I grew up in, I grew up in this small town. And um, essentially what happened there was my family had not had a quote unquote religious affiliation for three generations. Now, oh, okay. that's not to say that they were agnostic and that's not to say that they were uh, atheist. They were generically Christian. And what do I mean by generically so? Lessons about God and divinity and religious experience was more often told in like day to day parables than they ever would be in like a formal setting where you go sit in a church pew and someone tells you what's going on. Oh, uh, yeah. Things like, you know, I once asked my grandfather, really good anecdote. I once asked my grandfather, um, uh, he was a gearhead and a truck driver, and uh, I asked, Are you afraid to die? <laughs> and he said, well, son, I don't think anybody wants to die, but you, if you think about it too much, then you forget to live. Uh, yeah. And so there's, uh, you know, these little parables, these little like common snippets of wisdom, but God was mostly communicated to us in comments like, uh, well, when the good Lord calls you. Oh, uh, yeah. And so eventually, um, I grew up and, of course, uh, began to date. And when I did so, uh, the being in the Midwest, not everybody was so kind of free thinking as my family. And I met this beautiful blonde <laughs> whose mother said that I may only date her daughter at church. Well, being a, like at church, like in like the building, church, like in church. Oh, OK. Yeah, like you will I'm only see my daughter in church. That is it. Right. Okay. Right. Hell yeah. That's a, that's a stance. Hot take. <laughs> so being it's hard to make blonde, out. It's hard to make yeah. out in a church, dude. Yeah, right, sure. right. So being a um, red blooded American young man, I said, well, okay, I guess I'm going to church. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's where so, that ends you. <laughs> yeah. So um, my experience there was that the first church I ever went to, uh, it turned out that this, this young woman's family was Pentecostal. Now, I don't want to, again, we have, we're on a limited time, so I don't want to bore you with the details, but um, if you had ever run into Pentecostals at church, mm -hmm. now outside of church, they can seem conservative, but normal. <laughs> In church, uh, mm, no, it's a different story. No yeah. offense to any Pentecostals who might be listening. Well, they're uh, real into tongues and super spirituality, right? Like, right. Yeah, like, for sure. We need so to do the, an episode on tongues at some point because that stuff is. Oh, I'm down. You know, like I, I would love to learn a lot about that. Yeah, let's so see if actually, we can find someone uh, that like yeah, speaks in them. Yeah. Uh, um, Galassia. And so uh, 
after I went to seminary, of course, I learned a lot about all this stuff. So uh, I'd love yeah. to come back and tell you all about it. Dude, talks. we'll have you on all the time. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. so, we, I feel like that's what we're missing is someone who actually still like, uh, holds the faith. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. So, um, long story short, my first experience in church was, uh, it turned out that not only was my first date with this young woman in church, but it happened to also be during a revival, which, as I would soon learn, was the worst possible time that you could be in a church. <laughs> <laughs> so I was sitting in the front row with her because that's where she insisted we sat. And the preacher, who was sweating profusely, and yelling very loudly, came down off the podium and uh, asked me if I would like to be saved and then proceeded promptly to stick the microphone directly into my face. Oh, man. Yeah. So here I am, a very young man, and there's about 300 people behind me. So I answered the only way a young man does, could in that situation. I leaned forward and said, Yes. <laughs> whereupon he began to shake my head vigorously and speak in tongues which was an interesting situation yeah um long story short somewhere around the midpoint in the ceremony um he banged my girlfriend's mom on the head whereupon she fell backward mm. hitting her head on the wooden pew oh and shit from what i understand lost consciousness God. But, <laughs> that sounds like the reverse of healing dude yeah. right so uh but they did not seem to mind they laid something <laughs> over her and proceeded to <laughs> jump, jump around the room. <laughs> no. uh, okay dude she that sounds re- like a fucking youtube video that yeah, i like dude. i mean you can watch you can watch some of these pastors get down on people yeah yeah man um, so anyway, she did regain consciousness somewhere sometime later. Um, <laughs> what ended up happening after the, uh, after the service was we were on our way all walking out and I asked her, are you okay? Now she looked down at me, this very impressionable young man. And she said, now, Anthony, you know, Jesus would never let anything bad happen to me. Ah, uh, shit. Oh. Okay. She turned and she started to walk away. And as she did, I noticed that down the back of her neck, there was blood running. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> it keeps getting worse, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's nuts. Um, I promptly realized that um, uh, whatever it was that this faith was, was not something I wanted to be part of. Yeah. Right. But I did anyway because she was pretty. Mm. Dude, the the <laughs> I, I do feel like, man, like the um some of the greatest evangelizers of all time were like pretty girls. Yeah. <laughs> I could see that being true for sure. <laughs> just, or really hot dudes. Yeah. Right. Real yes. hot dudes. I like I guess. I I just feel like uh what's the uh you know, there's so many verses in the Bible about like uh wives love your husbands and shit that like come Mm. back to like um and some of the times it was like dude like your husband doesn't believe in god so you gotta like convert this dude Uh, you know like you gotta get this dude over you know so my second experience um is much shorter basically we went to youth group it was a wednesday night i went downstairs again just trying to be with my girlfriend They were talking about the time that Jesus exercised a man with several demons in him. I asked what a demon was. There was an odd pause amongst the youth pastor. He went to the bathroom and excused himself, whereupon he returned and continued the lesson without really answering my question. After the service was over, the pastor actually, you know, everybody shuffles out to this tiny little church. Uh, The pastor called me into his office, which was right by the door. I sat in there by myself which was odd. Yeah. And he sat on the other end of the, at the other side of his desk. And he said he was going to call my girlfriend's mother and inform her that I should not be dating her daughter. Oh Oh. shit. Just cause you didn't know what a demon was. 
So, well, not exactly. It was more nuanced than that. Yeah. I asked why, and I was a rather um, outspoken young man. And I said, why in the hell is that? And he said, well, you see here, we believe that to speak about Satan is to give him power. Oh, shit. So you're not even allowed to know what demons are. Correct. So now I, I've had two interactions with traditional Christianity. And one tells me that people are nuts. And the other tells me that um, you can't ask anything. Yeah. This, even at a young age, smacked, smacked suspicion to me. At the same time, um, there was something in me that seemed to tell me that whatever there was out there, uh, it couldn't just be this world. But I went through most of my teenage years in a pretty much crisis of faith. Mm. Um, you know, running back and forth between these polarity points. You know, there has to be something more, and that probably corresponds with my culture and and you know uh, well, these people are freaking nuts right and just back and forth yeah. well eventually i came to my grandfather who was um fairly well off at the time and i asked him uh it came time for me to go to college and i had reached a decision because and, and this is the real the real point so i'm not going to say his name so he won't get fired because he's still teaching Okay. Yeah. But while I was going through my, uh, cause you know, public schools and everything, while I was going through my crisis of faith, uh, I had a psychology teacher in high school and he, that was about the most scientific <laughs> this little town got. Yeah. That's crazy. I've, I like, I never had a psychology class in any of my, <laughs> so we went through this and Eventually, we got to existential meditation and all this, and I was asking questions of a religious, fairly religious nature. Um, even back then, though I'm getting up there in years, it wasn't okay for teachers to discuss religion in the classroom. Right. Yeah. But he did, gently at first. And then it got to the point where I was debating him. Yeah. Um, and where I would go to him while he had his study hour, which was really his hour to grade to eat lunch and create papers. And right. I would be debating him about religion. And of course he won because he was an educated teacher and I was a 16 year old kid who knew nothing about the world. <laughs> yeah. But the point is that it raised the specter of a question that maybe it isn't all just materiality. Right. Yeah. And anyway, the point is that this debate led in me a need to know. And mm. every time I went to church, all they asked me for was money and obedience. So yeah. finally I decided that what I needed to know uh, can only be learned in an academic setting mm. because yeah. that way they're not trying to convert you. They're just trying to teach you something. Yeah. That makes and sense. it helps that you've already paid them. <laughs> <laughs> Long story short, um, when I went to my grandfather and told him what I wanted to do for college, he inf uh, I informed him that I wanted to go to seminary. Now, my grandfather owns a freight business. Okay. Um, he's a truck driver, yeah. and he was a self-made man. So this is how that conversation went. Well, what Have you thought about what you wanted to do? Yes. I would like to go to seminary. What in the hell are you going to do there? <laughs> well, I want to study church history. Now, sidebar, the logic behind this decision was if the answers were back there, if, the, if there were answers, one assumes that the further back you go, the more clear the answers would become. Now, that's whether or not Jesus was a, you know, nothing at all or whether he was really the son of God. Right. So I wanted to study church history. He said, and I quote, so let me get this straight. You're going to go study dead people. No one cares what they said. They're dead. <laughs> That's an interesting I said, take. I care. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks, Grandpa. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll forget everything you ever said as soon as you're gone, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. You're not, hey, I mean, you're not long for this world. <laughs> right. I mean, like, am I going to forget you too? <laughs> well, 
long story made short, uh, he agreed so long as I decided. So he agreed that he would pay for my seminary schooling so long as I agreed that out of my own pocket, I would find a way to, to pay for uh, some kind of backup. So I go to seminary content to be a church historian. One of my first classes is intro to Christian philosophy. Yeah. I walk in and they are studying. Um, I walk into my first day and we open our books and we begin to study uh, Thomas Aquinas and what's called the argument of the movers, the argument for motion. And my entire mind is opened in that moment. Well, suddenly fucking the- tell us about it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Yeah, yeah, don't fucking hold out on us. <laughs> what is well, that? Uh, I'm probably going to butcher this because I didn't come prepared to teach a philosophy course, but I'll I'll try my yeah, best. Yeah, just give us the cliff notes, dude. Right, man. So the argument for motion uh, works like this, that we may not know who God is, but we know that God must be. And this is why. Because if you define God as a physical body sitting on a cloud somewhere with a beard, watching everything you do like the proverbial Santa Claus then of course God cannot exist. And keep in mind, these arguments were being posed about 800 years ago. So this is mid- the medieval mind saying there cannot be a physical man on a, ch- on a chair somewhere. So let's get that straight. Mm. After we do this, uh, Thomas Aquinas begins to talk about something called motion. And by motion, what he really means is change. It's strange that there is change. And if you think about it, how the complexity of the universe seems to denote that action always results in reaction. Now, that makes perfect sense to all of us, right? So let's make an analogy. Simple. Um, there is a tree. We start with, a, with an oak tree. We say, wow, that oak tree is amazing. Uh, how did it get there? Well, this is when science would step in and say, everything about this oak tree could be explained by natural processes. Therefore, we don't need God. Mm. Maybe, but let's rewind the clock anyway to see what we figure out. So, the oak tree got there because it was a seed. The seed got there because it had a previous oak tree, and on and on and on backward. But that wasn't the end. See, the seed was there because of the soil. The soil nutrients were there because of other animals and on back to plant life. The plant life was there because of the sun. The sun was there because of gravity. Gravity was there because of the universe. Essentially, everything moves backward in time and has its root in the universe. Okay, and how did the universe get here? At this point, you have to understand a couple of things. The first thing you have to understand is nothing can give itself what it lacks. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Nothing can give itself what it lacks. The other issue that you have to understand is you have to know a little bit about physics. Now, Thomas Aquinas made this argument not based on the physics of the day, but physics has done nothing for us but help this argument along. Mm. And here's how it works. Everything that is measurable can be quantified into time, space, energy, and matter, right? Now, the universe is currently expanding. You go backward in time and you find that the universe is getting smaller. Eventually, you find that the universe is so small that it goes into something called the quantum singularity, which is when the universe is smaller, essentially, than a subatomic particle, which is to say that it doesn't really exist. Right. Right? Okay. Now, we all know about the inflation of the universe. If you don't, I would want your listeners to google it yeah inflation of the universe took took place in a fraction of a second where the universe expanded many hundreds of thousands of times its own size yeah but never changed in mass all of this stated we come to our final conclusion this means that contrary to previous versions of the universe okay where the universe had always existed forever and always 
The universe, actually, scientists have all but accepted now that the universe came into being a finite time ago. Mm. Therefore, there was a change, thus the argument for motion. There was a change from nothingness to somethingness. Now, if you're talking about something simple, like, I don't know, a blade of grass or something, that seems almost plausible, which is how science gets away with the kind of limited arguments here. When you're talking about everything, then it gets more complicated. Now, here's the kicker. Here's the punchline. When the universe came into being, we have to ask ourselves, what constituent parts of the universe came into being? The answer is time, space, matter, and energy. That subsequently went on to make up everything else. Mm. Now, nothing can give itself what it lacks. Therefore, when the, before the universe was, whatever gave birth to the universe was timeless, spaceless, matterless, and infinitely powerful, mm. because its proportions must have been capable of producing at least as much energy as was put out in the quantum singularity. And we know from doing the numbers that that is infinite. Right. What do we know of? What human concept have we ever thought of that has infinite power, but is timeless, spaceless, and matterless? Right. A God. Gotta be God. The concept of God. Yeah. Yeah, that's a I'm I'm so I've never heard it. I didn't know it was the the movers, but I've heard um, similar uh, arguments for a uh, creator from like uh, William Lane Craig. Yeah, William Lane uh, Craig hits that a hard. Some other because when I was a Christian, I, I got into the uh, the more apologetic side of things. So I've heard some of these things. I never knew about that um, particular one. But the way you put it, I think was. Uh, very eloquent. It, the 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 concept of nothing can give itself what it lacks, uh, I think, is a great way to put it. Um, I've always heard uh, the most simplified version of it just being like, you know, you know the how, but what's the why? Like, why is it all here? We know right. we've we've come to the point to where we we can explain. Oh, Big Bang, this, this, that. But if you see a ball in the woods, you don't just go like. The ball just appeared in the woods. You say, "Why? Right. Who put yeah. the ball in the woods?" Yeah, that shouldn't be here. Yeah, and for sure. In the same way, it's like, "Why are we here?" We yeah. there's no reason for us to be here that we can discern of. Yeah, essentially, I, yeah, essentially, what you're asking is, "Why is there something rather than nothing?" And it turns out that it's far more likely that there would be nothing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I and I think that you know, me and Walter will probably. We, we would both say that we're agnostic, I would think. You yeah, know what I mean? Like, yeah, I can yeah. get down with something creating something. Well, I went from theology, and now I'm, like, in this space where I'm, like, I don't know it's true. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was that. Yeah. Uh, or maybe it's that plus something else, or maybe it's some of that, not all of it. Um, but I am still in a place where I'm, like, one, it's going to be a saddening and hard day if I ever have to accept that there is nothing more than just the material of right. the universe. Yeah. And I don't want to go there. But two, um, I really think that it's worth exploring and there's enough evidence out there to really consider a spiritual realm and what mm -hmm. that could mean. Mm -hmm. So yeah. here, while we're busy, we're, so far what we've done is really explore like the Christianity side of what I what I believe. Yeah. Incidentally, I'm also a high magician. Right, yeah. Right, right. So, so I, <laughs> that's like some shit. You know what I mean? Because all right, <laughs> I'm all about that. I like. I think that that is fucking incredible. Because like. I, I mean, you and I could probably, you, I, and Walter could probably debate Christianity for fucking ever, right? Like, right. Um, um, I think Walter has a really good grasp on, like, the apologetics and shit like that. Like, um, I remember having conversations with him about that stuff years ago, you know, and um, um, he, he, like, took this, uh, you have a deep mind for it, you know what I mean? Um, whereas, like, me, I have, like, um, I think my big thing is like evil. Like I have problems with it. Um, and like, I, I've always said like, 
I'm down with Jesus. I think I think his dad sucks though, right? Um, and uh, so we need to spend some time together. Yeah, dude. <laughs> um, but I do think that what's rad is that you are able to totally believe that a man, Jesus, died for our sins. Right. And then with that, be all about fucking alchemy and right. high magic and things like that. Because uh, the, the, the small things I've read about hermeticism was like, you know, like the Order of the Golden Dawn, mm-hmm. you know, which that's Crowley, right? Like Crowley took that over. Um, I mean, he didn't start it, but I, I guess he like overthrew it, you know, and like uh, right. kind of took over the Order of the Golden Dawn. And that dude was all about magic and shit. You know what I mean? And like um, um, and alchemy and, and things like that. So uh, we're getting off track of your story. Yeah. But I right, like right. when did that come in? Right. Okay. Like when did they, cause, yeah. cause uh, yeah, I get like, you went to seminary and shit like that. You learn Christianity and you're like, all right, I'm cool with this. Right. At some certain right. point, I don't want to make your story easy, but then at a certain, at a certain other point you were like, all right, cool. Now I also want to fucking do magic. And how <laughs> deep does that magic go? Like, do you so like, tell me about, like, tell me about your alchemy. Tell me about your magic. Tell me about how you, uh, um, how you are okay with that and Christianity, because I don't think, I don't think many people are. So, um, what happened was it really started, uh, in seminary. Mm. What ended up happening was I, I remember now go way back. My family was generically Christian, right? Okay. Now, That meant that when I, though I went to a Catholic seminary and I did so because I wanted the finest education I could get my grandfather's money could buy. Um, (laughs) yeah, uh, dude, people, people send their kids to Catholic school all the time just because they're good schools. Right. 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 I mean, so when Catholicism, a lot of times is like more genetics than it is like actually going to mass. (laughs) Right. Like people are always like, I'm, I'm Catholic. And it's like, you haven't been to mass in years, homie. Right. So what ends up happening here is that, uh, I'm, I'm trying, I, I was faced with much of the same. So now I'm like, okay, great. There's a God, but who is he? And then sometime later through various stories, I won't bore you with, I came to believe that it was Jesus. Okay, great. We've got that element down. But now the question is, is the church right? Uh, yeah. Because of course I'm learning liturgy. I'm learning deep theology. I'm learning mysticism uh, from the point of view of Christianity. And I'm starting to find, okay, well, I'm really cool. I can see the liturgy being really important from the first century. I can see the historical continuities there. I can't see papal infallibility. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because it didn't start until the fifth century. It's like this whole thing, right? So long story short, um, we end up getting into a place where I'm now having a new crisis of faith. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, okay, great. I've, I've figured this out, but now which version of Jesus is Jesus? It's like, find the Jesus. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, who, who's Jesus is real. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so long story short, um, I was eventually approached by a man whose name I won't say. Um, and he informed me about an organization that existed called the order of the white road. Okay. Okay. Is this secret society type organization? It is. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah. And, um, so stay tuned because that's actually what I'm here to promote. I actually have to get permission to be here. Okay. Oh shit. Yeah. So, um, now let's lean a couple things out here. Uh, are we talking about evil reptilian cults that sacrifice children in the dark? The answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> Emphatically no. I'm yeah. happy to hear that. Yeah. Thank yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank Jesus on that, dude. This no, podcast no. would have taken a turn, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, no. We're, 
We're not talking about that. In well, fact, and I think our listeners too would know too. Like, uh, if they've been with us for a while, even if they're Christians, like we talk to a Satanist, dude. Dave Outlandish yeah. is a great person, mm-hmm. you know, and like, <laughs> like fucking and fucking knows a ton about Satan and demons. He honestly, when you were like, I asked about demons. Mm-hmm. That's the same thing that tripped Dave up, right? right? right. Like, and uh, so yeah, I think that you know, go as secretive and as you know, pagan and as occulty as you want. Like, I think that people right. will still accept you, right? Right. <laughs> At least here, so we just we just always got to be clear about that because people get worried about things. And the very first thing when I say when I tell people, you know, well, I'm a member of a secret society, the first thing they say is, why is it secret? And I have to explain, look, some things are kept secret to hide because there's something nefarious going on and some things are kept secret to protect. Right. Um, And that's kind of what that's all about. Well, it's why, sorry, I keep cutting you off, but that's why like a lot of Satanists will like, it's the difference between Christianity. Christianity is so accepted that people, you walk into a coffee shop, somebody will tell you they're a Christian, but you know, through Uh, We had Tiffany Boggins on a witch and um, um, Dave Outlandish. And it's like, we tell people that we're Satanist or witches and people get fucked up. Like, (laughs) like people throw shit at people and people are super mean to people. So Mm -hmm. I totally understand like not being completely out there with your views, you know? Right. Right. So long story short, um, I was, I was made aware of this organization called the order of the white road. And eventually what I, what I came to know once I joined them is that I ended up getting a mentor. You're assigned a mentor almost immediately and they are an academic organization. So first thing is there's not like formal church services where you go and you sit and like they preach at you about like, this is how you live your life or like, this is what you should believe. What you're doing is as you're working your way through study and as you're working your way through these things, they're, they're helping you work through them because they are really experienced. They're like linguistics experts and like hermetists and PhDs and various things. And they're doing all these things. So long story short, um, slowly but surely, I am just handed books, right? And these books help me to like, uh, you know, Eliphas Levi, you know, I'm handed several of his works and I'm handed, uh, several works on Kabbalah, which are really not, not like, like, Hey, go out and do this. They're like commentaries on Kabbalah. Yeah. We're talking, you know, tarot and uh, and stuff like that. And so I'm handed all these things and then, what's eventually happening over time is I'm developing like, holy, holy doo doo, man. <laughs> Friggin' like I read through, uh, as a good example, just as a, as a, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I read through the Egyptian book of the dead. Oh yeah. Immediately I saw Jewish ideals being present. Yeah. Um, You know, they ask you things that, you know, the gods will, the guardians and the gods will ask you in the Egyptian book of the dead, like, did you sleep with someone else's wife? Did you lie? Did you cheat? Did you steal? You can see outlined the Ten Commandments. Yeah. And suddenly you're starting to see like, okay, well, there's a continuity between Egyptian religion and Jewish religion because that makes perfect sense if you take the Exodus as a historical thing. And because during their time in Egypt the Jews would have been influenced by their slave masters. Yeah. Right. Long story short. So I'm starting to see all this and then I'm starting to, uh, read things like, uh, the history of magic from antiquity to the modern era. And I'm starting to see that the Jews had their own brand of magic. Yeah. And when they spoke about suffer, not a witch to live in the old Testament, what they were actually doing is speaking about the difference between licensed magic, so to speak. Yeah. Right. Magic that was allowed and magic that was not allowed. Yeah. Mediumship is one that's really famous in second Kings and first and second Kings that's talked about. Well, why was that bad? Well, I think that we failed to realize that mediumship is a form of necromancy. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically what happens here is that slowly but surely, oh, and then we get into the real kickers. Eventually we turn our attention to Jesus and we hear things that were never taught in churches that we're not allowed to believe in churches. Things like Elijah was supposedly reincarnated. Yeah. And how do we know he was reincarnated? Because Jesus revealed in, in uh, the Gospels that he was John the Baptist who had already been killed. But we right. know from earlier Gospels that John the Baptist was born, grew up, and preached. Mm. There's no way that Elijah just popped out of existence. And then, of course, we know from later prophecies that Elijah is supposed to come again. Yeah. So how is this going to happen? He's going to be reincarnated. Where do we find reincarnation? We find it in Kabbalah. So what's the missing element whenever Christianity goes to Greece? Um, Paul washes it clean. Mm. He washes it clean to fit into the worldview of the Greeks and the Romans, which did not necessarily include reincarnation. Yeah. Long so, story short. Yeah, so oh. we get Jesus also saying things like the transconfiguration on the hill where he took three disciples up, did some crazy stuff, then on the way back said, hey, don't tell anybody what you found. Right. Yeah. yeah, dude, I, I've wondered <laughs> shit like that, you know, because it's like even Moses, right? You think of Moses and shit, and Moses threw down a staff and it turned to snakes, right? right. And it's like, is is that not, ma like, that's magic, right? <laughs> like, like, yeah. It's all magic. It's magic. You know, <laughs> like I think that so to to, you know, well, I be think, so against it. I think what you said, the the Paul thing was so interesting to me because Paul wrote so much of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you also have the books that go, I guess, side by side with the, the New Testament that aren't included, like the gospel of uh St. Peter, I, I remember learning about this because I was fascinated with the upside down cross symbol. And then I found out, oh, it's from this Gnostic text where Peter is like mm -hmm. having a magic battle with another sorcerer right. and then yep. he gets uh, executed upside yeah. down or something. Um, so is, is it kind of a concept in Hermeticism that like Paul kind of like tried to clean up the image and then the church later when they decided on what books would be included, we're like, we'll take Paul's stuff and we'll kind of scoot all this stuff out. So let's be clear about something again. Hermeticism broadly speaking is a hodgepodge. Yeah. The order of the white road specifically is Christian hermetists. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Right? All right. So they have their own understanding Right. And that's based on some pretty solid ground when you start to. So this is not something I'm saying like, you know, like I, I watch, I listen to a couple of your episodes and most everybody's saying, look, I respect everybody's views and la, la, la. It's like, I respect everybody's views, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. right. <laughs> uh, you know, um, so long story short, it's based on history. It's based on all these things. And what in our understanding in the order Basically, what this means is Paul had arguments. This is pretty well documented with the 12. Yeah. And he yeah, was he was Roman, not cool with a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. And he was a Roman citizen and he was educated as a Roman citizen in, in what's called Platonism. And at the time, Neoplatonism was real big. Mm -hmm. So what happens is he takes the message west and he goes to the cities of the Greeks and he goes to the cities of the Romans and he needs to appeal to the intellectual elite, the rich people, so that he can get traction and funding for his new plant, his new church plants. Right. Um, because of this, if you've ever tried to start a religion, you know that you have to at very least be very pol prolific. You have to you have to write a lot. So Paul wrote and he wrote to or all start of a various, podcast right, or start a <laughs> podcast. Paul didn't have much of a choice there, but, <laughs> <laughs> but long story short, he wrote to everybody. Um, it, it's very interesting when I began to study the differences between Paul's view of the law and James's view of the law. 
And then you read in Josephus that James is the brother of Jesus. Yeah. Who grew up with him his whole life. And so we have Paul saying that the law is dead. We have James saying that without works, without following the law, you don't have um then works then faith is dead because oh, yeah. what what difference does it make in the world now so that i don't get too preachy here's the hermetic side effect of this the alchemical side effect magic is not really the suspension of the laws of the universe it is law against law law against law can you can you explain that to me i'm not i'm trying <clears throat> to follow but that i'm not sure what that means right so if I want to do something, let's just look at, um, let's just uh, think about chemistry as an example. If I want to do something and I determine that it might be capable of being achieved via a, uh, a chemical reaction. So if I have a, a horrible worldwide uh, pandemic and I hypothetically want to make a vaccine, I don't want to violate the laws of nature because that's impossible. What I want to do is find a combination of laws of nature that I can put together in a certain order in a certain way that will make nature work for me, okay. not at my will. That's alchemy. That's alchemical principles. Yeah. And if you think about it, that is the foundation of every scientific thought that has ever been thought. Yeah. And science is the very reason why I'm able to talk to you right now. Yeah. Right. We, my friends, are doing magic right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, fuck yeah, dude. I, I'm now, down with that. I love when people say that we're doing magic. <laughs> I, want you, I, I want you to think about it in a different way. The men in the white robes of yesterday became the men in the white lab coats of today. Okay. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that mystical magic, what's called in the order sorcery, doesn't exist. It just means... That because of the principle of as below, as above, so below. Yeah. That the you that the metaphysical universe works according to a set of laws as well. If you learn those laws, then you can work a science, which means a scientia, a knowledge based on metaphysical principles, which will cause certain reactions. Okay. Therefore, magic is always seen as this massive suspension of the universe like the universe has certain rules we magicians come along suspend those rules and now we're able to do whatever we want we are gods if we were all gods then there would be a bunch of immortals walking around yeah we're not gods but we are scientists of a kind yeah i get i can get down with that i think that uh i think that part of my like part of my journey has been being like all right like you know uh the catholics you know turn turn a wafer into jesus's flesh right like that's magic transfiguration right? yeah it's magic uh um when people pray to a god you know what i mean to um divinely enter into their life right like what's the difference between a witch creating a sigil you know i don't i like i don't find a difference in that um on the base level you know like on that you are trying to do the same thing you are trying to have the divine intercede into your life right through prayer or through magic so i'm i'm down with that i'm down with like magicians being scientists too because it seems like you know they couldn't do all the shit that they do yeah, I mean, if right. if a scientist went back in time and was like, "Here's a fucking chemical reaction," people would be like, "You're a witch." Yeah, burn it. Mean, it's time to die. It's bitch. time to burn. Time yeah, to fade the piper, motherfucker. Yeah, fucking a. <laughs> well, I, dude, I think that that's something too. Like saying that, man, is like the uh, Christians believed in a lot of this stuff, right? And then, uh, but then you have the Salem witch trials, which those people were trying to do the same shit, and they burn them and fucking stacked rocks on their chest until they fucking you know, couldn't breathe anymore, you know? And so I have issues with that. I like Christianity won out is what happened, you know? Yeah. And so that's basically what went down. So the, what's called the Imperial church, um, 
began to be governed in 325 AD with the Council of Nicaea, but there were motions in that direction beforehand, say the Council of Milan, or the Edict of Milan, sorry, a few years earlier. Long story short, uh, the Imperial Church formed a narrative, right? Which, if you think about it, is not that far, f- is, 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 is actually very mystical. I mean, you think about the Nicene Creed, You know, a lot of people hate on the Nicene Creed because, oh, this is the evil imperial church. But you can still feel the influence of the magic of of the magicians, right? Light from light, true God from true God, Mm. right? You can still feel the mystical influence slowly and sure. But surely, though, that drains away, especially in 1055 during the split between East and West. You guys are probably familiar either with Protestant or Catholic ideas yeah. of the West. Very few people are more consistent. I call myself, uh, when when describing myself as an as a Christian, because people don't get it, I say I'm Orthodox. Yeah. And the reason that they get confused by that is because we believe in something called theosis, okay. which is the idea of joining the mind with the divine here in this life. Mm. Yeah. And that's your Holy Spirit, right? No, no, no. The okay. Holy Spirit uh, is in is imminent inside of each person, but this theod- theotic state, this theosis, is something that can only be done with time, meditation, and discipline. Oh, okay, okay. So, dude, that's a lot like the uh, the Gita. I've been yeah. reading the Bhagavad Gita, and it talks okay. about a lot of that of the. Um, oh, I can't remember the word for it. I'll put it in the notes, but. Um, there is a word for like when your mind and body and everything joins, you know, um, at one. Do right. you do you think that all these religions are connected? Because that's, that's a hard. is that a hermet that's a hermeticist thing, right? Gener- generically, generically, modern hermeticism seems to indicate that there is some truth in everything. Yeah, the ultimate incarnation of that would be like Baha'i. Yeah. Now, I don't buy into that. And the reason that I don't buy into that is because I'm too much a historian. Yeah. If I if I read, if I watch, if I study, then I can see that cultures don't necessarily have, you know, uh, you know, contact to gain these kinds of things at some point or another. Here's what I do believe. I do believe that, uh, you know, th- think of Jung, right? Like the collective unconscious. Yeah. I think that all mankind has, I call, I, when I teach my students in the order, I I call it the residue of Eden Mm -hmm. and we have a residue of Eden, a memory just beyond our reach about what it was to walk with the divine. Okay. And because of that, we have, we carry, when we develop the theological ideas, they all tend to the same direction because they're based off this aspiration of returning to Eden. Yeah. So in that sense, I think they're all connected. It explains things like the golden rule, why, you know, do unto others, right? It explains love thy neighbor. It explains, uh, it explains all these different things. It also explains the vast similarities between, uh, Taoism, Buddhism, and Christianity. Mm, Yeah. Um, especially, you know, know, I mean, the Gita was written, what, 5,000 years ago. Right. You know, and they have, um, there's like, I think that there are verses in the Gita that I could rattle off to a Christian and they'd be like, oh yeah, that's in the Bible. (laughs) You know what I mean? And it's not, it's just, you know, being a person who has read both thoroughly, um, well not thoroughly. I read through the Gita in like the last, like maybe two months. Um, so it is fresh in my head, but I, yeah, I think that so for me, like part of my thing is I, I think that there's like a lot of locks and a lot of keys, you right. know? Um, and I think that that would also explain why I think, I mean, hermeticism and magic, like a lot of Christians don't even believe that you should be able to fucking do that. Right. Like that, that shit doesn't make any sense, but you are able Anthony to like, uh, rectify that in your mind. Well, it's, I think that the problem is that they are listening to a narrative that developed um, that 
long after the the you know they so in other words they're not studying at the sources for themselves yeah they're they're allowing their pastors you know uh, the bible is the num- world's number one best selling book yeah. ever in history and yet it is one of the least read yeah i so mean the, a lot of them are sitting in uh drawers at motels yeah <laughs> You know, or on or on somebody's coffee table to make them look and feel good because they're part of a club called Christian. Yeah. But very few of them actually understand what happens is we specialize. Yeah. And we allow our student, our teachers, our pastors, our, you know, our theological minded friends to interpret the Bible for us. And we get into that place where we're just like, oh, I heard someone say that one time or Joel Osteen said that. Therefore, it is. Ugh. Which you know, I don't yeah, even whatever. want to talk about Joel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, so I, I think I gotta ask some questions, dude. Dude, I've dude, got a big it. one. Real okay, quick. give it. Hit me with a big one. One, one that you asked Tiffany that I thought was real, or I don't remember who asked it honestly, but I, I, what does magic look like in your life as a a Christian and a hermeticist or a Christian hermeticist? What because you the the description of magic that you gave was very like it's everything and it's also you know uh specific things and I just wonder how you express yeah. is your it, magicianship, yeah. Is it mystical? Is it you know what is it? Uh, okay, so that's uh, all the above, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, so check this out for a minute. What is magic? If you ask me what magic is, I would say magic is the study of change. Okay. So what does that mean, right? Like, if you think about it, there's this paradox uh, called the motion paradox, where motion shouldn't technically be um, possible. Why? Why? Because the space between any two objects is technically infinite when looked at mathematically. Why? Well, if I fire an arrow, that arrow must, before it gets to the other point, it must first travel halfway. And then before it travels that far, it has to travel halfway. Before it travels that far, so and so on. Long story short, um, I recommend looking up the motion paradox to fully understand what that means. Yeah, I'll put that in the comments for sure. Right. Long story short, the study of change, how and why things change, when you define it that way, then the change, the part of the causality of things is mental. And when you identify the causality of something to be mental, then literally willing it is possible. But simultaneously, the manipulation of physical matter is also a product of change. Mm. But it should be noted because anything that was manipulated by human beings, be it with your hands or with your mind, is the product of human will. The scientist willed the experiment and went through the process of developing it. Therefore, everything actually comes from the mental space. Okay. So let me- So everything's magic in that case. In that sense, everything that changes. So can I ask you a big question then? Sure. So if we can do magic, then why do we need God? Ah, because we have to get back to that motion argument. Okay. So in Hermeticism, the big concept here is that the universe is mental because the universe does not exist like a marble held out here in the arm of God. Well, they... they say to like um from what i read i don't know where you stand on this but it's like um they you know w- what's the verse in the bible where it's like uh if it's sealed on earth it's sealed in heaven yeah, right uh, what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven yeah so and right. hermeticists believe that everything that happens on earth is also happening in heaven and everywhere above, else and above, so below yeah and then also but as above so below and as below so above that's right right so me and walter are doing this podcast in heaven right now not technically okay <laughs> that's sorry i'm asking so many fucking no, no, questions no, no. You're dude fine. You're fine. let's cover let's cover like why do we need god 
why do we need God? All right. Well, in a hermeticist idea, the universe is mental. What does that mean? It literally means that we are the, the fiction. We are a fiction. We are emanations of the divine's imagination. The world is not a marble which God gave birth to and now exists apart from God. The universe is, subsists in God. Now, what this really means is that none of us actually exist of our own will. And so there's, so there's two things that there's two kinds of beings. There's contingent being and non-contingent being. We all are contingent being because we find our being, our ground in another. And it, what is that other? It's the universe. It's all the stuff that makes us possible. The laws of physics our parents except and, the, and just like the oak tree I made reference to earlier, it goes back and back and back. We need God because we're not contingent because we're not necessary beings. We are not synonymous with being. We mm. could not exist. And so long as we don't not, we could not exist. We can't emanate out from ourselves of our own volition. In other words, that sounds very complicated, but the long story made short is we can't create from nothing. And since we were at once one point nothing, nothing can give itself what it lacks. We need God because He is our root. So we're nothing a, you're saying nothing exists without Him. Right. That's why we need Him. Right, because God is not a person. He is the pre existing conditions for being, the pre existing possibilities for existence. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, that does. I so do you have more questions, Walter? Um, I hope I didn't bore you guys. No, no, <laughs> no dude. No, no, no I just have a ton. I like, <laughs> all right, because I just, I, I hate to keep hitting on the Christian thing with you being a hermeticist and shit too and magic and all that because I love it. I love magic and I'm trying to learn how to do some of that. Um, but I do think that like, you know, I have a problem that like, because um, you said, you know, predestination and things like that so your your argument is that uh we need god because he created everything and we can't be anything without him everything right. goes into motion because of him correct right? right and i have no choice no 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 hold on did you say so, i i couldn't i thought you said that we have no choice in the matter no 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 no, no okay no. In, in a lot of ways, I guess you could say that there is one thing that you don't have choice in, and that is you are. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, um, I didn't make this the choice. Fact that, the fact that you ever were, that is, that you birthed into being at the moment of consciousness, one might argue, um, that is not your choice. But it is definitely your choice to continue to be. Okay. So let me – so this gets us into a conversation about time. Again, we're running short on that very yeah. resource – so I won't go into it, but the long story short is the theory of A, the A and B versions of time. I, of course, believe uh, in version A, which is to say that the universe doesn't, the, the future doesn't exist. So people say, well, God knows everything. Therefore, he knew everything I would ever do bad and every bad thing every person would ever do. Therefore, God still created them. Therefore, God is the root of evil. What if that's not the case? What if God knows everything, but the definition of everything is now? Oh, so God can't see the future because the future isn't there. God can see all possibilities, but the decision is yours because the future doesn't exist. Okay. I can get down with that. I can get down. But, but okay. Well, I, no. If he, if he was the one who gave us time, then he would have to be outside of it and therefore not bound by the limits of it. Right. right. Only be no, no. Hold on, hold on. Only before the invention of time. So once he created time, then he was also bound to the laws of time. No, no, no. Not bound to it. So let let's think about this for a moment, shall we? Yeah. I'm what is time? What is what is time? Time is temporal becoming. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you live or die or change. It's it, the only thing that matters is you change state. Right. Okay. If God said things change, once upon a time there was no existence other than him, then there was other existence other than him. This is a change of state. That state can be measured. God enters time. 
So wait a minute. Does that mean that God changes? It means that God changes state and that he perfectly knows what time it is at all times. But even if you wanted to argue that God must somehow be a bubble outside of time, then how do you explain Jesus Christ, who himself entered time? No, wait a minute. Well, Jesus left time at one point and went back to the Father. Wrong. Can't happen. Once you enter time, there would have always been a time in the past that you were in time. That represents a change of state. In other words, God is now temporal with us. He made himself temporal to be with us. Mm. Uh, okay. Huh. So, all right, that's deep. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. It's a lot to unpack. Um, and also the concept of, I've always, I feel like God is, has always been uh, given to me as an unchanging character, not as one who is a changing. And so he created time and change. And then I've also always been told, obviously, he's outside of time um, and he knows the future and yada, yada, yada. I haven't heard the argument of he's also uh, within it to be with us. Um, he perfectly, yeah, he perfectly knows what time it is all the time. He has perfect memory, and he has perfect understanding of all possibilities. But he doesn't time travel. But he doesn't time travel. So he is not Dr. Manhattan no. from Watchmen, <laughs> right? But, so, so let's, so is let's he talk changing? about... He is changing in that he perfectly knows what time it is now, 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 now. Okay. Does he change in... So what does he mean when he says, I am the Lord, I do not change? Is he faithful? So let's ask this question. The obvious next question to my students whenever I bring this point of time to them is, well, what about prophecy? Yeah. Okay. How long ago did we make an appointment to be here? Uh, it was probably weeks ago, right? Two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So when I prophesied that I would be here, did I tell the future or did I fulfill a promise? Did you prophesy that you were going to be here? So I said I would be here. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Right? So if I prophesied that I was going to be here, did I fulfill a promise? God is eternal, which is not the same as saying God isn't temporal. God is eternal. Okay. Now, if God is eternal, then he exists perfectly at the moment when the Israelites are not yet out of Egypt. Mm. He says... I will do something great. I will deliver my people. Sometime later, he delivers his people, but that's because he made an appointment with them, not because he saw the future. God is capable of doing things at the times that he promises. Oh, uh, okay. I got you. So God, God is all powerful. So God says, you know, uh, one day, like in Psalms, they talk about, um, Jesus, right? There's the, right. there's the, uh, there will be one who goes through much suffering and has hung by a cross. And they talk about all that shit before right. even crucifixion was invented, like all that stuff. So God says those things. He whispers those things into David's ear. David jots them the fuck down. And then God in, you know, however many years from that was like, all right, I said all this shit. So I'm going to put it in this dude's head to uh, invent crucifixion. I'm going to put it in this dude's head to uh, uh, wash his hands of my son. So he was able to do all that stuff. He said he would do it, so he did it because he is all-powerful. Right. But you still would argue that we have a choice. So hold on a minute. Yeah, that feels like a violation. That's of free a violation will, sure. of free will no, no, for no. sure. <laughs> Let me explain. First of all, I love you, Anthony. <laughs> no, no, no. So first of all, Nowhere in the Bible, anywhere in the Old Testament, does it say that a man will be hung on a cross? Anywhere in the Old Testament. It says, Find that for me. I think it says in Isaiah, what is it, 53 yeah. or 51? That he will be hung on a tree. Yes, a tree. Yeah. Okay. Which people interpret as a cross. As a wooden isn't cross. Necessarily. Yeah. All right. All right. So bear with me here for a minute. What I what you are not taking into account, okay, is what I said about God knowing all possibilities perfectly. Now, is that impossible? Let me explain something. 
this universe works in such a predictable way that if I were to flip a coin and I knew perfectly the preconditions in which that coin existed, the um, resistance of the wind on that coin, all of that, that every single time that I perfectly knew the preconditions of that coin, I would perfectly be able, without fail, to predict whether heads or tails would come up. God knows everything, but we must ask ourselves, what is the definition of everything? If it is true, then in all possible worlds, crucifixion would have been invented. Why? Would you let us not make crucifixion complicated? It's a way of torturing people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's pretty simple. If I put nails through people, it hurts, and that's pretty scary. So surely Romans were not the only ones to invent it, by the way. If we scoured all of human history, I'm sure we'll find someone else nailing someone else to something else. Okay. So the bottom line is prophecy, when created like this, but also we have to ask ourselves, how limited is God's promises? Right. Does it affect everything? Are we talking about God decides how many puppies are born to a litter every day or who wins the Super Bowl or whether or not we're here talking about God right now? Or does God only do certain big things such that his signs and his presence is known? Okay, so you're saying that maybe he doesn't control. Maybe he can control everything, but he doesn't. Right. True. He but the big things. He intervenes, but as above, so, that's so below. The, that's yeah. How, how is that different from us? Yeah, but that I mean, what you're saying, you know, it sounds like that also solves like the problem of evil and shit like that because he's like, I just intervene when I can, and shit happens without me knowing because I am I made myself temporal. Like the Holocaust started. The Holocaust started, and Jesus was like, "Oh God!" <laughs> like, <laughs> well, no, you had to know because if he knows all possibilities and things, he are knows that it's possible, right? He knows. But it's here's possible. the thing: pre-knowledge does not mean action. My pre-knowledge that you that you could be here talking to me now did uh-huh. not equal my action to intervene to make you be here. Sure. Okay. But, it was still your choice. But now, if, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Okay. Why? Well, if God is all good, then why doesn't he intervene to stop all these bad possibilities? Yes. Rape. What is forced love? Okay. Yeah, I've heard. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I don't know if I would quantify personally rape as forced love. So, I think it would be a, a control... Okay. It's, it's done out of same, control same and out different. of power, yeah. right? Same, same difference. At that, at that point, it's semantics. But let's talk about something else. In the Bible, so we talked about how God was faithful, right? Sure. In the Bible, the very first thing God does with mankind is he gives them dominion. Yeah. He, ge- he makes them the rulers of earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Name all the and, animals and all that shit. Do your when thing. He, yeah, and when he interferes, when we see, like, angels interfering with life and stuff like that in defense of demons, for instance, as, as a, just one hypothetical in the Bible, we often find that those evil forces, those dark forces, are depicting as supernaturally interfering with the course of human affairs, causing insanity where insanity did not, did not exist, causing harm where harm did not exist, etc., and supernatural rectification is needed. But very seldom, not always, now I'm not saying that, this is not a universal statement, but very seldom does God interfere in the natural course of human affairs. For instance, much of the Old Testament is told from the point of view of the Old Testament. However, you don't see God interfering with every other kingdom on the planet, though they acknowledge that it exists. Okay. Why is that? you do see him do that every once in a while, but no. very seldom. I guess, why is that though? Right? Like, I think that, that this is a problem for me. Yeah, I, I think, <laughs> well, I think the thing is, like, even with the, uh, you know, the, the concept of he knows all possibilities, uh, uh, um, 
perfectly and he can predict things to a certain measure because of the predictability of people and of the universe and all that stuff. I still think that you can make the same arguments of he chose not to intervene. And I had heard the argument of like, well, he also needs to allow us our agency that he gave to us. Um, but he chooses when to violate that. If, if we're going to say prophecy exists. Um, and, uh, just because, and not knowing, I guess for certain that something's going to be a certain way doesn't mean, I mean, once it starts happening, if he's within the same time as us, he can still shut it down. Like, yeah, dude, he could Thanos snap the Holocaust. Yeah, if he right? didn't, hold on, hold on. Sure, sure, sure. I, I want to make an example for my own personal life. Okay. So just recently I lost a brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I lost him. Uh, he was a very different creature than me. I lost him to OD. He, mm. he OD. Damn. Right. Yeah. So many people are dealing with that also. Yeah. yeah. For years and years and years, I came into his life and I attempted to tell him, "Stop what you're doing. This life you're you're living, it will be the end of you." Right. Mm. I warned him. I told him. Other people attempted to do something about it. Short of going in, tying him up, putting him in a padded room, and forcing him in one place, there would have been no stopping him. Yeah. Right. We've all been that way. We've all been in that same circumstance where you could do something, right? But because of laws which are exterior to you, because of circumstances which are exterior to you, maybe just because you're not willing to go that far, you could do something about something that you know is bad, but you don't. Because to do otherwise would be go to such extremes. We often associate God with this father figure whose job it is to make us comfortable. Never mind that he gave us dominion. We don't realize that to do that is at the cost of our free will and free agency, such that he could force us to be happy-go-lucky people. But to do so, right, where everybody loves everybody and there is no pain and suffering. Yeah, I'm, I get where you're saying. This is the argument of free will, right? Like, he, we have to have free will. You can't, you can't program a robot to say, I love you, and that robot actually love you but or be kicker. loved. Here's the kicker. What he was just saying a while ago was, yeah, but I still can't see how God would n know the possibility and not prevent it. This is an emotional appeal. An appeal that says, look, I acknowledge what you're saying is logical and makes perfect sense, but it still feels wrong because we are associating in that moment a certain role of God, which is to solve all of our problems and make us happy. We're not God's pets. We're his children. If you want to look at it that way. Yeah. And just like children, there's only so far you can go once you reach a certain age. You have to be accountable for yourself. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to step in and help my kids every time they need help. Yeah, I think so. That's I think that I think that that's the issue, right? God, God, like we didn't call him our father. Jesus did, right? Like he assumed that role as our father. Well, and also just real quick, personally, as a father, I wouldn't, if, if my children were being holocausted, I wouldn't, I couldn't feel comfortable with that. Maybe that's because of the fallibility of my, you know, small mind. That's not fucking God's brain. Yeah. But because of that fact, I'm going to have a hard time accepting that as a loving action. It's, I mean, I'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility or it's wrong to believe that. I'm just saying on a personal level, yeah. I, I have a lot of trouble accepting that. I, I have a as, as, a, as a final thought, I have one last thing to ask. Sure. So how old are you guys as kids? My, I have one daughter who is uh, five and one who is like two and a half. Okay, so both still rely on you for everything. Uh, yeah. My son's 12. Okay, so... Both, all of you guys as kids still rely on, on each other for everything. So what I want you to do is hypothetically, right? And I'm, I'm trying to be gentle. Yeah. Yeah. No, hit it with us. 
Yeah, dude. Go, go in your mind, and you're like 60. Your kids are like 35. Mm-hmm. They live separately from you, and they're using heroin. Yeah. Uh, you know that's stupid. Mm-hmm. And you know that it's going to hurt them. Maybe, maybe it already has. And you've already intervened in their life such like as far as you personally can. You have exhausted your own power. Now, you could go seek a court order, but that's going to be pretty hard. It may not be successful. At the end of the day, um, you know, your kids already live with you. He's abandoned his, you know, he or she has abandoned their children. They've been homeless several times in and out of um, rehab several times. Now they're living with you. They've, they're draining your income and now, then they get violent one day. Mm-hmm. What do you do? I don't think that's a fair comparison to the Holocaust. Yeah, no, hold I was. On, hold on. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is where I'm putting you is exactly, and it is a fair, fair uh, analogy, and I'll tell you why. Because what I'm putting you into is a situation where you have power. We yeah. all have power, right? And actually, the laws of society make it feel like we have less power than we do. In reality, it is within my power to kill, maim, destroy, force, kidnap, tie up at any time. Right. So it is within my power to do. The question is, is it wise? So from the point of view of God, where he's not dealing with individuals, he's dealing with a whole people group. Mm -hmm. Right. So equally, equally true that the Jews are his children is equally true that Hitler is his child. Right. Now, I, I hate to say that. We all cringe at the thought. Oh no, dude! I I I don't I don't cringe at that thought. I mean, the Bible says that if Hitler fucking loved Jesus and accepted his cross, like he'd be in heaven. Well, you know, like I, I mean, you I, can't. I personally, believe in a few more nuances. But, <laughs> okay, cool. But the point the point is this: equally, any conflict in mankind is a conflict between his children. Sure. Yeah. And. Any intervention on God's part that would be sufficient enough to, shall we say, miraculously solve the problem Mm -hmm. would interfere with everyone's free will for two reasons. The first is that it would go in and, and immediately take from all the direct actors their free will. And the second way is it would reveal his presence. Divine hiddenness is part of God's respect for our free will because okay if we all knew for a fact that there was a god no doubt allowed we saw it with our own eyes it was on cnn Mm -hmm. right we would all be whatever that god said he was if it was a hindu god we would say we're all hindu because we saw it at least the vast majority of us the yeah. same. Tr- the same is true for Christianity, Judaism. Yeah. Uh, whatever, dude. If you but saw the- a dude being God, <laughs> you would you would join up with. I don't him. know. I might not, dude. I'm, yeah, I'm I might not either. Real. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just but saying the, question, the majority of the people. The question is this, right? Then why are you following that faith? Is it because there's truth in it? Now, what I mean by truth is like moral understanding. Or would you do it simply because you now have proof and you don't want to be on the bad side of God? Yeah, I don't see a problem with either of those, though, right? Like, I don't see a problem with if God showed himself to us and people were like, damn, that was right, in trying to live a godly life or not to go to heaven, which is something that he promised us, right? You know what I mean? Like, I don't see a problem with with people believing God just because he's right or with people believing God because they morally want to line up with him. But there is a problem. Why? Everybody goes to heaven in that scenario. No, 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 no. So here's the deal, right? Right. If you, so I'm putting you again in the same shoes as God. If your wife pretended to love you every day, but hated your, hated the way you live, and hated you because she hates the way you live. But you were like richer than her and like could take her for everything she was worth in a divorce. Oh, but wait a minute. God is infinite. God, you can't take anything from God. Maybe so. But the thing God wants is our love and respect. 
So the issue that you get into here is you, you again put God in this emotional place. What I'm trying to say is very seldom does our, do our, does our breakdowns of the universe have anything to do with like logic. And we were put, if we were put exactly in that same logical position, we would often do the same thing. But because we are in a different place and registering from a different emotional space, then we start to say, ah, we start to play like, like the quarter, like the, the day after quarterback. Mm. Right. And yeah. like, oh, this is, I would have done that totally different. Right, yeah. right, right. But I do think that this is a difficult thing. Oh, yeah. Because and, and the comparison of like a wife and a husband, I think, is always going to be difficult because of the power dynamic of that. That uh, uh, it shows a level of equality between two people, and this is an infinitely good being. We're told who has our best interests and loves yeah. us unconditionally. And at the same time, if we're not loving him the right way because of how he revealed himself, all of a sudden there's a problem for him, and it's yeah. like. I don't know. No, dude. no, 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 no. God, we are equal with God in that God wants a relationship with us based on consent. For sure. It's just a weird thing to me that you create something and then you want a relationship with it. Right. Like I can make this argument as having a kid <clears throat> is that uh, my son did not want to be born. Didn't choose it. Right. He didn't choose that shit. I chose it for him. That's right. Right? Same with God. I didn't choose this. God chose it for me. Right? Okay. So I choose this life for my son. And at some point, my son goes, you know what, dad? Like, I don't want to hang out with you anymore. Right? I don't want to respect you. I don't want to love you. I don't want to hang out with you anymore. I can look at my son and I can either, one, say, all right, you're cut off from everything. I'm, I'm going to uh, either you love me or nothing. And worse than nothing, not only nothing, I am going to put you in hell, right? I'm going to do the worldly, the worldly whatever of hell to my son because he doesn't love me. So God made us and then was like, you need to choose to love me. No, 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 no. That is a Protestant modern misunderstanding. And this is this small misunderstanding, like an arrow and misaimed by ever so slightly at the source, has led to such problems at the end. All right. Solve this for me. All right. So if your son did come to you and said, you know what? Screw you, dude. I'm out of here. What would you do? What would you like? Okay, so you wouldn't do all these horrible things then. What would you do? Uh, well, at the end of the day, I don't think that I could hold him guilty um, because okay. my son. So my my argument is that um, if my son chooses not to love me, right. that should be okay. Okay, cool. But right? what would you do? Well, I mean, I would continue um, to. I mean, honestly, if my son wanted nothing to do with me, right. I would just wait for him to come back. Maybe I would wait for him, you know, to get a hold of me. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, it's his choice. Like I do not deserve love and respect for my kid because of things I've done or so anything. Like I, what, I, what I'm asking you is your son is now an adult. He looks at you as an adult and he says, dad, I no longer want to have anything to do with you. Screw you. I'm out. Would you continue to pay his electric bill, his gas bill, his rent, his mortgage, his for his car yeah. His insurance? Yeah, yeah I so would. You, but you that's will, because so I'm you, a that's because I'm a communist. OK, right. Like that, like that at the end of the day, like I, I would try and do that for anybody I could. Do you? Is it in your opinion that it is always your responsibility to support your children financially forever? As long as I can. Absolutely. It was my choice it, to have my child. 
right? And I don't okay. have a lot of money. It's not like I'm I'm fucking rolling in it and my son can do anything and no harm. You know what I mean? So so let me get this absolutely I just want to put a pin on this. Yeah. Your son is an adult. He owns his own home. He works his own job. He tells you though and he makes enough money to support himself. You know this as a fact. He's out of your house. He has told you to screw off that he wants nothing to do with you and the checks keep coming. If I can, I will choose to support my son. If I am able until the day I die, right? Because in the reason being is it wasn't my son's choice to be born. I, I under, I it was my that. choice. I just, I just really want to make clear in this circumstance that what I am saying is a very specific, isolated, draw a box around it scenario where your son is an adult working on his own, can make his own money. He's not disabled in any way. He's not on the street. He's not a drug addict. He's married. Told you he doesn't want anything to do with you. And you are sending him checks because he didn't ask to be born. If he needed a check, if he told me, if he told me, I need I've a check, already, Dad. I've already precluded. He's working and makes enough money to support himself. Yes, I would. If I could. Okay. If that's what okay. he needed. If that's what my son needed. So right? I guess, well, need is precluded by he makes his own money. Or what in is, his is head, different... you know well, what I so mean? What, we're trying to get down is the difference between need and want. And I think I would, I would personally feel that that's something that we are in the role as parents trying to teach our children, the determinations between need and want and access X. Okay. I can't say this word, right? Excess. Yeah. Excess versus like self limiting and self discipline. Yeah. But then again, we're talking about God here, right? No, hold on, hold on, hold on. So what has happened here? So what we're saying is, look, God, you can make like mountains of gold and make us all happy and joyous and lovely and wonderful. My friend, have you ever seen a kindergarten class? Yeah, my son was in one. Great. They're all happy. They're all safe. They're all protected. They're all comfortable and they can still be dicks to each other. That's my point. Kids I don't know if that's I don't know if that's completely true. I think that kids are like us talking to God. I think that us talking to God, like me and Walter and God, we are like babies, right? In the eyes of God, right? So my only like my only argument is that I have I take issue that I didn't ask to be born. I didn't ask to be made. Right. But I was right? right. And we can take that all the way back. Like your argument, like uh, we can just like the fucking sapling, dude, just like the oak tree. We can take that all the way back. Right. Adam and Eve were not asked to whether they wanted to be made or not, but God made them just to kind of have something to, you know, uh, I don't know why, you know what I mean? That's like the question of life, but he made these two people and then was like, ah, uh, you need to love me. Well, after Adam and Eve, you know, because they ate the fruit. Cause God was like, don't eat that one. And they ate the fruit. He was like, now you need to love me. You will be eternally separated from me and you Hold need up. to learn to love me. So I would like so since you've made your final point, I would like to make my closing argument. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, okay. All right. So a while ago, what you said was, we're like babies, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Personally, from my own personal point of view, I would agree with you so long as we're babies. Okay. To that, I would say the following. God did not put us down in this world totally unprepared Un and, and with with him unavailable and distant, pointing the finger at you from point from far away, being the proverbial Santa Claus and saying you will get coal in your stockings unless you are a good little boy, a good little girl, because what is I don't know, I'm going to come at this from a really weird angle. I like weird. without right. I want you to exclude 
mankind from this question. So exclude all of mankind and everything mankind has ever invented or created. Okay. What is the deadliest weapon in the universe? Uh, well, nothing. No, nothing. Or, well, we I mean, know the chimpanzees use sticks and rocks. Yeah, well, I don't. I'm not a chimpanzee, dude, so I don't know what's deadly to me. You know. Um, All right. So let's just say that let's just agree for the sake of argument that it's something like blunt force trauma. Yeah. Okay. Right. Stick, rock, something like that. Okay. Deadliest weapon. We are not simply. We are not different from the animals simply in degree. We are different in kind. Because I want you to now, in your mind, I want you to compare and contrast the most deadly weapon known to man. Uh, what? Nuclear weapons. Thermonuclear yeah. weapons. Okay. So the, the closest, most intelligent animal to us living today is capable of throwing a rock. And we have harnessed the power of a star such that we can annihilate a planet if okay. we wanted to. I, want, I, I would submit to you that as far as this world is concerned, we are not babies. We are the closest thing that we can see to gods. We are stardust built in the early universe. We are the universe knowing itself. We are able to harness the power of the universe both for good and for evil in the same move that we have been able to build weapons that can annihilate the planet. We have been able to build vaccines that annihilate disease. God gave us his creation and we can change it to be whatever we want it to be. And we argue that because God gave us our creation, that therefore he should fix all of our mistakes. That isn't right i'm i'm not arguing mistakes though i'm not arguing mistakes i'm arguing atrocities right like that's what we are arguing is atrocity that i, I think would that say that's, that yes it's not like god's it's, job to fix hitler it's, it's not our god. job okay but, but i think the thing is like when he chooses for me personally and we need to probably wrap up yeah so, yeah yeah But yeah. we'll have you on again i'd like to talk more about yeah this for stuff. sure awesome. um i think for me what makes it hard is when he chooses to intervene and uh it feels like he does take a personal interest when you read stories from the bible it seems like he is like oh these people this atrocity is happening to them i'm going to free these people i'm going to love these people i'm going to intervene here and here and here but where he draws that line, it can feel really painful. And I'm not saying that's like what you should base your entire no. theology off of. I'm just saying for me, um, it was it's a hard thing to reconcile. Oh, yeah. I agree that it's emotionally difficult. It's yeah. real hard. Yeah. And for me, this is different for you. You had the logical, the historical, the uh, theological teachings that carried you through that emotional hard place but for me right. it was enough even with the knowledge i had on theology and apologetics yeah. it was enough to be like you know what i'm gonna look at other stuff i'm not saying it's definitely right. not true i'm just saying i'm opening up my mind to other things and yeah. um you know i i appreciate talking to you i appreciate hearing your perspective yeah. on things i think it's definitely challenging stuff to go through and logic yeah. through and separate yeah. what's your feelings and what is the truth um and i think it's good for our podcast to have uh uh people that are going to challenge us on things and yeah. force us to really critically think about things um, yeah so, i hope i didn't make you guys mad i meant it oh love. hell no no dude. no, no dude hell no i you have to understand like i i do you know walter and i love you and it was great having you on and we want to talk more about this stuff. Like you didn't yeah. offend us. We're going to have different views no matter what. I mean, um, you know, even if, even if you save our souls, dude, we're still mm -hmm. going to have different views. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that this is a discourse that needs to happen. Right. Right. 
And it's a discourse that our listeners should hear, right? Because we've heard witches and Satanist and we've heard everybody. Like, we want to hear everybody and we want to hear you. You know what I mean? And I want to hear what your views are, you know? Um, but the tome is also about, like, you know, loving well, I think and respecting. What's hard about this is um, as two ex-Christians, a lot of these talking parts are points and concepts uh, probably have hurt us yeah. in the past uh, with like, right. and uh, maybe if we came across sensitive or anything like that, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. No, we no. appreciate your I just wanted to ask, I wanted to ask big questions, dude. We had no, a dude no, no, on no, here, yeah, you dude. know, listen, listen guys. So as a final thought from my perspective on that, on that issue, yeah. Uh, you know, I want you to know something, and that is that I wasn't here to proselytize or be like oh, Christianity yeah. is the right way in any way. That's why I didn't say like give your heart to Jesus or yeah. something. But what I was saying though is that like uh, the church in its various in, uh, manifestations, remember that it hurt me too. Yeah. Right. Right. And I get that there's there's this there's this logical thing like, OK, that makes sense if we're in a cold, logical world. And then there's the emotional bit. Mm -hmm. And the emotional bit is like, I just cannot reconcile that. Yeah, I get that. I understand where people are. And unfortunately, the problem is often not with God, like as, as a like concept. The problem is more about like looking at people who claim they represent God and saying, how the how the hell does that work? Mm, yeah right because people suck i yeah. get that yeah yeah well thanks for um coming on before we go though um do you have a, a verse we usually ask someone if they have like a little verse to contribute to the tome of chaos <sighs> oh man a little piece of wisdom all anthony um I don't know, man. That's a hard one. <laughs> you put me on the spot. It's uh, deep, dude. Um, if you don't have anything, that's fine too. We can just cut this whole thing out and forget it ever happened. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. Um, You've definitely imparted. Never wisdom. stop seeking, man. Never stop seeking. Oh, I dig that. Yeah. I dig that. Hell yeah! That I think that yeah. that is. That needs to be written at the top page of the town <laughs> for sure, um, <laughs> for sure. Um, and then, you know, I we usually we try and do a challenge, too, if you have one of those, like a challenge for our listeners. Um, it can be anything. Uh, one of them was tell everyone that tell everyone you talk to one for one day out of the week that you love them afterwards. Um, so it could be anything like that. My challenge is wrestle with yourself. Okay. The, the key to this episode is ask big questions and more than arguing with me, we were all arguing with ourselves, yeah. right? Who is God? Wrestle with God and wrestle with yourself and you're going to get tired and it's going to be hard, but never stop. Yeah. I Hell dig yeah. that. I That's dig a good that. one. Hell yeah, yeah, dude. Hey, Anthony, we're going to saint you to chaos real quick, dude. So we put our hands together and we're going to bow our heads, dude. <laughs> And now you're a saint of chaos. You can write that on all your stuff, dude. We'll send you a plaque if we ever get them made. I love it, dude. Anthony, I love it. thank you so much for being on. Um, it was incredible. Um, and we do care about you. I'm not upset with you. You know, I just want to ask big questions to people who have an understanding. Yeah. And oh, if, no, dude. I love it. Do you have any, like, uh, yeah, what do you, you want to plug? plug or. Yeah, dude. Uh, go to uh, thewhiteroad.org and check check the order out. Um, oh, yeah. It's not just me. I'm one of many masters, and uh, we're always looking for new membership. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you can get a hold of us from that website, and you can say, hey, look, I heard it. Um, screw you. Or, hey, I heard it, and I want to know more. So yeah, if you uh, it, it, hit with that, and then, you know, if you have big questions like I had also, you know, send that. Yes. You know. So, um, yeah. hey, Anthony, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to get out of here. This was a long one. Thanks yeah. for sitting with yeah. us. Follow right, us guys. on Toma Podcast. Uh, Toma po 
Tome of <laughs> Tome of Chaos. Chaos podcast on everything. Send us emails if you uh, if you want to hear from us. If you want to ask us questions. If you think there's something we forgot. If there's something you want us to ask Anthony, because I'm sure we're going to have him back on. So please send those to us. Big questions and things like that. Yeah. Um, we love you all. Um, and I hope chaos walks with you this week. Hell yeah. Peace. Bye guys. See you, man.